Before we get going with the program, I would like to welcome folks to the offices of First Things Magazine. And I look around the room and I see um, all these intelligent looking people. So it, it strikes me as implausible that there might be someone in this room who doesn't subscribe to First Things Magazine. <laughs> Every once in a while, I do run across a person of superior intelligence who's not reading First Things regularly. Um, but uh, usually, we can get them in the right, going in the right direction. And so if you're not a subscriber to First Things, you really need to remedy that uh, and sign up uh, right away. We have copies of the magazine in the front. You're welcome to take a copy with you uh, when you leave. We also have a very active website, firstthings.com. Well, enough advertisements. Uh, and uh, before we go with our panel, I would like to introduce uh, uh, the Consul General of Poland here in New York City, uh, Masi Gulagewski, who will make some make some remarks uh, to, to get us going. Masi, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much, Rusty, for hosting this. I'm very excited uh, about it. It's been on. It's, I've been planning this in my head for 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 many months. I've been around for a year and a, and a bit. Um, and I always uh, wanted to do an event where we can discuss uh, Poland, Central Europe, and the politics of the region, politics of Poland particularly, because we're talking about Poland, uh, in the context of the great anniversary that we have this year. It's the 100th anniversary of Poland regaining its independence. Uh, Poland has a, had, a, had a history which is a little bit complicated, but I think uh, what makes uh, us very uh, uh, what unites us, Poland and the United States, at this moment in time is a certain concern for what's happening globally uh, uh, on the world stage. Um, there are a lot of question marks. We just talked to one, uh, Professor Vermula that we're living at a time, where, at an inflection point in history, I believe, where there's a lot of new reflection going on about political systems, uh, uh, about uh, constitutions, about how countries place themselves vis-a-vis -vis all sorts of global trends, and, and Poland is a member of that, obviously. It's a member of the West, it's been for, for centuries. Uh, and it's also grappling with all those challenges. One of the challenges is the sovereignty. Uh, what can we do as a sovereign country involved in a lot of uh, contexts, global contexts, supranational contexts, intergovernmental contexts, and otherwise um, to, uh, to reform ourselves? Uh, does the country after 1989, uh, after almost 30 years of transformation, is that are we, are we really ready to say yes, we're done, we're done, we are, we are a country which does not further need to reform itself, uh, need to just rest on its laurels, or doing, we in fact have laurels to rest on, what else is to be done? And uh, as you all know, Poland has been exposed to the barrage of criticisms, and I think uh, the lack of nuance, and the lack of context, and the lack of in-depth uh, uh, discussions about Poland is one of the things that really, putting it very simply, uh, bugged me. Uh, and I'm, I'm, <laughs> and I'm, a, I'm an American educated uh, Pole. I went to college here. I studied political philosophy, so it's a bit of a vicarious experience for me to, uh, to, to, to be here. I, I, I almost became a political theorist at some point. Uh, I really enjoyed first things, and I'm very, very happy that we can do it here. Um, I think we share a lot of values, <coughs> Poland and the United States, uh, especially values uh, when it comes to religion and public life. And I'm, you know, I'm just really thrilled that I could have organized in the context of our uh, centennial of independence. So uh, thank you again uh, for being here. I hope you'll enjoy uh, our guests. Uh, I, I picked them myself. I was really happy to do that. that uh, I'm in a position I could do this. Uh, and they were very kind to agree to come together. And I'm, I'm excited about it. So again, thank you very much. Thanks, Rossi, for making making this possible and doing all the legwork uh, for this event, which I, which we here at First Things greatly appreciate the opportunity to to host. Um, simple format: we're going to have uh, remarks from our guests, uh, Professor Bizarre Lubuko, who is a uh, professor of ancient philosophy and also um, a representative for the people of Poland in at the EU, and he's the author most recently in English. Uh, the book that I think many people have found quite engaging and interesting, The Demon 
the title of which is The Demon and Democracy, Totalitarian Temptations in Free Societies. We'll hear first from Professor Lukuko, and then Professor Adrian Vermeule, who teaches law at uh, Harvard University, and his most recent book, Laws Abnegation from Law's Empire to the Administrative State. Uh, Adrian will speak. And then Jeremy Rapkin, who teaches law, although not a lawyer, He's a, a higher, more noble calling as a <laughs> political philosopher, and, um, and he teaches at George Mason University. And uh, his book, Law Without Nations, obviously relevant to today's discussion, as well as I love his essay title, If You Need a Friend, Don't Call a Cosmopolitan. So we're going to go in this order, and then after that we'll um, have some questions. I'll ask a question or two, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Professor Lugoko. Ladies and gentlemen, let me start at uh, looking at my uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, So sovereignty. Uh, let me start with a his historical perspective. Uh, uh, remembering my young uh, days in the uh, People's Republic of Poland in a communist country and uh, whenever we, uh, the Polish people, but also uh, uh, other nations in that part of Europe, whenever they uh, opposed the system, whenever they protested, it was always the question of sovereignty, even if they were uh, demanding more uh, money, right? They were demanding bread or freedom uh, uh, or, or protesting against uh, their uh, colleagues being arrested. It was always behind us a question of sovereignty. Uh, we wanted to be sovereign, that is, we wanted to be able to decide what we want to do and how we organize our, our life. So it, it was a, an obvious thing for us to have sovereignty. Now, the paradox is that when the old regime fell, almost immediately, uh, uh, people started talking about uh, the necessity to join the European Union, the great international European organization, and the access to the European Union meant that you have to give up some of your sovereignty to the uh, uh, supranational European institution. Well, the paradox is, as I said, that the moment we had what we wanted so much, we were told, or we told, we, we, we told ourselves, that uh, now it's time that we have to give up uh, our, our sovereignty. And, and uh, some part of our, our sovereignty. Of course, the European Union is not the Soviet Union. And we kind of uh, hoped that... Uh, did I say it's not? <laughs> uh, uh, and we, we, we kind of hoped that uh, this would be European community, sort of uh, brotherhood of nations, right? the, the community of, 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 of equal partners. Uh, but uh, after uh, several years, it became uh, clear that the European Union is not as nice and as, as friendly as uh, some of uh, us believed. And the question of sovereignty uh, uh, re-emerged. Uh, people again started talking about uh, the uh, uh, necessity of sovereignty or regaining some part of sovereignty. Why? First, because uh, we found out what it meant to live in a world that is homogeneous, ideologically homogeneous, that, uh, that there is a kind of ideological monopoly in, in the Western world. We had had a ideological monopoly in the past, but then you could always uh, well leave the country and go elsewhere, right, the other side of the aisle curtain, uh, as a tourist, as a student, or you could defect. Now, if somebody is not satisfied with the ruling ideology, where can he defect? I mean, it's everywhere is practically the same. I mean, the, I mean, the same language is, uh, uh, is used. 
Secondly, because uh, we have been uh, watching the construction of a supranational uh, system uh, which uh, try to annihilate the existing uh, uh, loyalties and identities. In, in other words, the European Union is trying to construct a new type of uh, society, uh, a new type to create a new man, right? A new, a new, a new European, right? A new European, uh, and that means uh, that means uh, cutting off from history, right? And this is a typically left-wing uh, position. I mean, uh, that you create, uh, you have a blueprint, you impose this blueprint on our society, and the uh, con con condition that have to be, uh, the, the condition that have to be fulfilled is the eradication of all that is deemed to be anachronistic, uh, 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 par parochial. Uh, outdated, obsolete, and and so on and so on. Uh, uh, so this uh, uh, new empire, all right, uh, this new uh, uh, system uh, was uh, extremely intrusive, or is becoming extremely intrusive. That is, in in order to create a new European man, you have to penetrate very deeply into people's. Uh, uh, minds, the way they think, the way they speak, we are what they uh, what they read, how they behave. Uh, uh, you know this uh, from from here that uh, uh, it's, it's becoming more and more intrusive. I mean, we the closer we are to this uh, fantastic paradigm, uh, uh, the the, in, the realization of this fantastic society, of everybody will be equal. Uh, all cultures will be uh, uh, flourishing. Uh, then, the, the, the closer we are to this paradise, the more we are controlled, uh, and, and the, the more we are uh, uh, regulated. And uh, and the uh, 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 point number three or four, I, I counting <laughs> is that. Uh, the question of sovereign, so uh, so sovereignty became a kind of refuge. I mean, if you if you want to uh, find a place of refuge, uh, uh, you want to hide uh, and, and and find some security against all these uh, offensives, right? This uh, 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 heavy-handed uh, policy of the supranational in, in institution, you, you you have to find well. Some place and sovereignty is is a is a shield uh, uh, which uh, uh, can defend you uh, uh, against the powerful enemy. And uh, the uh, the last point I uh, I want to make uh, uh, why why sovereignty again is uh, that uh, this new supra uh, national organization or set of uh, uh, institution is uh, very obscure in terms of its uh, rules and mechanisms. That is, uh, there is an uh, official kind of system which you, about which you can read in the treaties, in the, in the laws that uh, were signed by all the nation uh, states, and you have some kind of European government, which is called the European Commission. You have uh, an institution called European Parliament, which resembles Parliament. It's not <laughs> as the European Commission resembles the government, but it's not quite the government. There is European Council, which resembles, I don't know what, but uh, <laughs> the Council of Elders. <laughs> but, uh, 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 so that, that is the, the official image of, 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 the, of the European Union. But uh, 
you know, politics is, you cannot, you cannot falsify politics. I mean, politics is about power. You cannot uh, 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 make somebody something powerful by stating it in a treaty. Power goes with all sorts of things, uh, uh, right? Money, economic potential, and uh, mm, uh, uh, it's military power. Uh, all, all sorts of parameters, right? Which uh, uh, constitute or uh, 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 make, makes a country powerful, more powerful or, or, or less powerful. Uh, so there is a, a real power play in the European uh, Union based on the actual potential that every country or every institution has. Well, Germany, of course, is the most powerful country in Europe. And, uh, well, Greece is not a particularly powerful country. So you cannot pretend that Germany and Greece are equal political partners. Because they are not. It's not that Germans are bad and Greeks are good or the other way around. It's just a matter of politics. And, and the treaties and the official propaganda say that these are equal partners. They are not. Uh, so certain countries, like my country, are uh, being told or are being reprimanded or, or uh, uh, occasionally by the European Commission, which is the supranational institution. But the European Commission is not really the institution that is the most important institution in European politics. It may be important, it may, it may be a powerful uh, regarding uh, to uh, Poland uh, because it is supported by the big players but it is not powerful enough to change the policy of German government or the French government. So we have several layers right, of power structures and uh, that creates a, a, a language which is well I have to say this is a mendacious language because we cannot really say uh, who is the decision maker. maker. We cannot say uh, be because the, the, those mechanisms are not clear. If you have, uh, uh, mm, if you have uh, relations between uh, individual nation states, these relations are more or less clear. I mean, you can talk about the open. But in case of European institution, you do not really know, you are never sure if this is really the Commission, or is it the uh, French government, or is it, uh, or it is the, the German government that is behind those decisions. The, the, the European Commission is very, I would say, gentle towards uh, uh, France and, and Germany. <laughs> but it's not gentle to Poland and to uh, Hungary and other countries. France uh, should have been uh, uh, punished several times for uh, budget deficit, uh, stated in the treaties that uh, such countries would be punished, but it was not punished. Why not? Because, as the president of the commission said, because it's France. <laughs> uh, so, so we, we are, uh, I, I, my time is up, so I, I finish by saying that we are more and more, uh, we, we live more and more in the world of uh, fiction mixed with reality, and it's difficult to tell which is which. That's it. Well, um, hi, I want to thank the Consul General for arranging this wonderful event. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have a chance to honor Professor Legutko. His book um, helped to awaken many of us from our, from our modernist slumbers uh, 
into the light of a new dogmatism. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the title of the panel is Democratic Reformers or Illiberal Backsliders, and my answer is both. Um, so let me start with a puzzle. I know of a number of uh, US, UK, European academics, journalists, other creatives um, who spend their careers in a state that can only be described as a kind of upset, maybe sometimes hysteria, directed at Poland, at Hungary, at Brexit. Um, and in this state of emotionalism, the meanings of words are redefined. So the Polish election, although free and fair, represents a threat to democracy. The passage of legislation according to constitutional procedures, such as the Polish parliamentary law and the judiciary, becomes a threat to the rule of law, and so forth. Um, and my question is, what's the root cause of this extraordinary reaction? So many have suggested that uh, Poland or, or Hungary have been experimenting with non-liberal versions of democracy. Um, that might be overblown to some extent, but I think there is a core of truth to it, and I'll simply assume it's true for the sake of discussion and say that it's, that still wouldn't explain the, uh, the hysteria. It might actually sharpen the puzzle. The puzzle is this. Why should a country like Poland be more an object of anxiety on these particular grounds than, say, Saudi Arabia or China? Uh, after all, those regimes are neither democratic nor liberal in any conventional sense. So why would a regime that is democratic but not liberal provoke more anxiety than a regime that is neither? I think that the key to the puzzle is liberalism's long-standing anxiety about its relationship to democracy. It's uneasy and in, in, a, in, in one sense a parasitic relationship. Um, so I want to draw on Carl Schmitt's introduction to the second edition of his Crisis of Parliamentary Democracy, in which Schmitt explains the polemical and political problem that liberalism has faced since its triumph in the long century between 1789 and 1918. As the doctrine of the 19th century politics of parliamentary monarchomachy, that is opposition to monarchy, liberalism made an alliance of convenience with democracy and for immediate advantage helped to cement the pervasive and seemingly irresistible notion that the fundamental criterion of political legitimacy is democratic, a criterion to which regimes of any kind at least pay lip service today. When this liberal democratic alliance someone un un unexpectedly came to power everywhere, starting in the second half of the 19th century, the alliance now lacked its common enemy in the monarchy and immediately started to fracture. So John Stuart Mill, as of 1861, was already terrified by the prospect that democratic majorities would constrain the experimental individualist projects of self-actualization by educated elites, and proposed, therefore, that these, um, these elites be given multiple votes in a representative system, among other privileges and other institutional checks on majoritarianism. I think it has since become undeniable that Liberalism both needs and fears democracy. It needs democracy because it needs the legitimation that democracy provides. It fears, however, that its dependence on and fundamental difference from democracy will be um, exposed by a sustained course of non-liberal popular opinion. In this sort of environment, the solution of the intellectuals is to try to idealize democracy so that mere majoritarianism that's a phrase I hear a lot at Harvard Law School, mere majoritarianism, never turns out to count as truly democratic. Of course the majority's views are to count on certain issues, but only within constraints so tightly drawn and under procedures so idealized that any outcomes threatening to liberalism can be dismissed as inauthentic, often by a constitutional court purporting to speak in the name of a higher form of democracy. We then have a democracy that's reduced to a periodic ceremony of privatized voting by secret ballot for one or another essentially liberal party, safely within a cordon sanitaire. In the limit, as Schmidt put it, liberalism attempts to appeal to a, what he called the democracy of mankind that erases nations, erases substantive cultures, and erases the particularistic solidarities that are constitutive 
of so many of the goods of human life. And Professor Legutko talked on, uh, touched on this in his remarks. In this way, liberalism attempts to hollow out democracy from within, yet retain its outward form as a sort of legitimating costume, like the donkey who wore the lion's skin in Aesop's fable. Okay, so I think we now have the answer to our puzzle. The answer is that the democratic polity that rejects liberalism is offensive on two counts, far more offensive than a regime that rejects both democracy and liberalism. For one thing, the apostate is more detestable than the pagan. That is, if the democratic but non-liberal polity was for a time a community in good standing under the liberal order, um, then its turn against liberalism represents a threatening retrogression. On its own premises, given its historicized eschatology, liberalism may expand but must never contract. But that's a contingent issue depending on the nature of the status quo ante. I think there's a second and more systematically offensive thing about a democratic but non-liberal regime, and that's that it threatens to expose the elite character of the liberal project. That is, liberalism is in many respects an enterprise created by and in the service of elites who capture most of the upside gains of ever greater release from customary moral and economic constraints and who are buffered uh, economically and personally from the downside risks. So liberal agents know and fear that the broader demos may reject their aspirations for ever more satisfying forms of creativity and self-fulfillment. Uh, and that the demos may protest when the customary norms and liturgies of the people are cleared away to make room for the restless, dynamic uh, liturgies of liberalism. So in this sense, I think Judith Schwar was right to emphasize what she called the liberalism of fear. But I think she was right in a different way and for <laughs> different reasons than she offered. I think the fear at the base of liberalism is that it will be left alone and visibly alone, uh, expelled from, detached from the ally on which it has so long depended to sustain and shelter itself. Thank you. So uh, I wanted to speak last, partly so I could um, respond to the other speakers, because I wasn't sure what we were really talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people want to hear about Poland, and Adrian and I don't have a lot to say about Poland, because we don't know a lot about Poland. Um, I do want to start by uh, praising uh, Professor Lubutko's book, which I think is really a wonderful book. Um, just the voice reminded me of Solzhenitsyn. I think that is a compliment. Uh, it's angry, but it's angry in a spirit of, you people should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and it captures a lot. I mean, I felt ashamed after reading it. Um, one of the things that he emphasizes is uh, egalitarianism is offered to us, and that's the sense of liberalism here. Liberalism as egalitarianism is um, kind of used as a battery to, to just like knock down every other thing that people want to defend. Um, I, I, I do want to just first put on the table um, of course, there's a lot to that. I very much recognized what he was uh, describing. Of course, you can see it in America. But I think it's not quite right, even though it's a sort of familiar idea. It was in Tocqueville, as Professor Marco rightly says. Equality, I think, is not the, the only thing. I'm not sure it is the main thing that uh, is driving social trends in the modern world. Uh, the first thing that we all have to remind ourselves is it's, we take it so much for granted, and it is not much discussed in famous older books. We're just incredibly rich as compared to people who lived even 100 years ago, let alone 200 years ago. Um, people don't, most people do not have to work so hard, and they have a lot of spendable 
income, and therefore they have a certain kind of restlessness. One of Professor Ludwig's excellent points is the modern world talks a lot about entertainment, and liberalism is constantly talking about entertainment, and entertainment, if you make it into a kind of pursuit in itself, there's something a little bit degrading about it. But that is a reflection, I think, more of wealth than of um, equality. So wealth is a problem, and people in the ancient world were extremely aware of that. Sparta was really proud of being poor. Um, Athens was proud of being rich, but it didn't turn out so well for them. So wealth is a thing we should think about. And, this, and also as a problem, because if you put this on the agenda and say, let's all make ourselves poorer, um, you will not be elected. <laughs> <laughs> and the second thing, which I, I think is just a reality of the modern world, apart from anything to do with ideologies, is um, we all know more about each other. Now that means we know lots and lots about lots and lots, so we end up not knowing very much about anything in particular but it's much harder for people to be encompassed in their own local traditions because you know we have television and radio and travel and it's just hard to say our world is the world of that counts. It's not impossible. There are groups that make a great effort to isolate themselves and good for them. They're in certain ways inspiring, but it's hard to do that in the modern world where it was just taken for granted as a, as a reality of life before that. So I mentioned these things to come back to nations and just to say, I think it's really important to emphasize uh, the sovereignty of nations because it's something that's feasible. Let's all go back to being poor, no. Let's all go back to being isolated, no. Let's assert our national sovereignty, half of every country, and in fact, three quarters of every country says, well, yes, actually, we prefer that to the alternative. Let's assert our sovereignty. So that's something real, and I think very much, I mean, Poland is an example to the rest of Europe, good for them. Britain is an even better example to the rest of Europe, even better for them, but it's asking a lot for Poland. I mean, Britain, you have to be really quite confident to say we're, we'll be out of here. Um, but I think it's, it's as a political project to say nations should reassert their sovereignty, it's feasible. And I want to, uh, I'll sit down in just a minute, I, I want to say just two or three things about why it's a little bit promising. It's not the cure for what ails modern man, but it's something that's helpful. So the first thing is if you want to talk about your nation, it's, it's not impossible, but it's hard to say, it doesn't matter, I'm not talking about the majority of actual people in my actual nation. It brings you back to something concrete. It's hard to fly in the face of what most people in your country want, so that's already an advantage. If, if the thing you're worried about is people having ideological constructions that transcend time and place. The second thing is, it, it almost inevitably brings you back to the past of your nation because it's the past that brought you the present. That's what it means to care about the nation. You care about its continuity, so you're interested in its past. It's good to be interested in the past because you see a lot of models of people who did things that are hard for us. They sacrificed themselves. They behaved nobly. They behaved admirably. Sometimes they behaved really badly, and other people said, that was really bad, and we're not going to tolerate it, and they thought about it. You learn a lot from engaging with the past, and you're more likely to do that, actually, if you care about your country because you'll care about the past of your own country. And finally, you just care about the future because you have to think in a somewhat concrete way, what's it going to be like for our children and grandchildren in our own country? So it, 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 it encourages a politics which gets down to a level of concreteness which everything about modern liberalism tries to escape from, so I put it on that ground. Let me just mention before I sit down, because I am interested in political theory, an awful lot of debate about liberalism is, oh, ever since the French Revolution, sovereignty didn't start with the French Revolution, people were talking about this for a while before that, but it is in a certainly important way modern. It is at least post-medieval. In another sense, it's biblical. I mean, when God gives you a model, it's national. And I don't think that was like inadvertent or the people who like wrote it down is that they misunderstood. Uh, the Bible gives you a lot of genealogies, the point of which is, here are all the different nations of the world. The Bible's really, I mean, the Hebrew Bible's really interested in the fact that the world is divided into nations. And it takes it for granted, or it sort of subtly suggests, and that's a kind of necessary aspect of the world that 
God has created, the world that we live in, it's a kind of given about the world. It's a sort of sensible way in which uh, people organize themselves. And I think you get a little bit of that, but as you get drawn back to a politics that's more traditional and in a fundamental way more grounded in a kind of seriousness um, by trying to take it one nation at a time. So I say to the polls, uh, good work, stay <laughs> with <laughs> I think I'm going to go in, in reverse order here and start start with you, Jim. Uh, what if you need a friend? Uh, <laughs> but you're not a cosmopolitan, so I'm, I'm saying. Um, you said that that Bizarre's book it it evokes a sense of shame that we've sort of let it come to that. Yes. And then you felt ashamed. So I just going to ask, what is America's role in all this? I mean, we seem to be implicated in this in a pretty deep way post-1989. Any thoughts on that? Yes. Uh, I want to offer two thoughts quickly. And one is, um, it's true that we encouraged uh, the European Union and, and we, you know, under Obama, we said, oh, no to Brexit, and we've like, discouraged everyone else from raising troubles. So in a very concrete way, we've kind of pushed that agenda. If, if you go to the level of uh, Professor Nabucco's book, which is much more about culture, uh, you know, Hollywood has a lot to answer for. And uh, quite a lot of what's degrading in modern culture around the world is either actually American or imitating something American. So we have a lot to answer for, and that's kind of sad. Um, I, I do want to say, I mean, I went down just by chance to uh, the battery, and I looked at the monument there to the 9-11 victims, and somebody had a good idea, instead of just being lachrymose, of just like, putting up a little monument to uh, America's response to 9-11, so it's like people in Afghanistan, and there's this little Latin motto of the special forces, um, which I, I'm afraid I will mangle if I try to uh, quote in Latin, but I give it to you in Latin, and I tell you, it's, um, uh, we liberate the oppressed. And one thing that is, I think, valuable about America as a force in the world is it actually thinks about projecting military force. And that's, you know, dangerous and serious and hard, and it doesn't always work out so well. Come to think of it, it's not working out that well in Afghanistan. <laughs> I, I don't think things are so bad in Iraq. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. these are, yeah. But there's a kind of seriousness about should we do this? How does it work out? What about it? And Europe, because it doesn't engage now in force, has become like the whole continent of people who are tenured professors and just sort of like <laughs> think their job is to be the critics of someone else's force. And that, I think that's kind of degrading to, to Europeans. And that's their fault. But, but would, I would say that America, we, we live in a kind of weird, we have a, this odd self-image of a nation without a people, right? You know, I, I was interviewed, and so, uh, the interviewer said, well, but isn't America a multicultural nation? And I said, of course not. Um, but I think for most Americans, and we, so the, to a certain extent, we export a kind of image of how you, of a, of a, of a nation that we don't actually live, but we imagine. I, I don't at all want to say we are Sparta or anything like that, but we do have an army. No one has a multicultural army, or whoever does doesn't have a successful army. Uh, right. If you expect to deploy force, then you have to be serious about who's, Who on, our, who's on our team. Right, right. interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, Adrian, liberalism, liberal, elite project that seems right to me. But wasn't it Aristotle said the best form of government is a mixed government? So the idea that there's an elite check on the middling sort of person, that's not just a modern liberal notion. Uh, no, I, nor, I don't think it is, nor did I say it was. So um, what's, wrong, what's wrong with yeah. that? You know, maybe, maybe what's, Aristotle's uh -huh. right. Well, I mean, that's so that feature of, liber of liberalism, which is that it tends to have this ambivalent 
relation to democracy, well, maybe that's a, maybe that's not, not so bad. Uh, I, I said nothing uh, normative. My analysis was um, sociological and psychological about why our elites are so upset in various mm -hmm. ways by the Polish and Hungarian case. Obviously, there's a broader conversation to be had about you know, optimal regime types and, and so forth. I'll simply give a co couple of observations. Um, every regime type has elites. I mean, that's the iron wall of the book. That's the point. Really. Point two is, um, of course, uh, elites predate what we think of as modern liberalism. And point three is, of course, they may serve valuable functions um, under some system we would prefer to liberalism. None of that is, is I think, contestable even. What, what is true and distinctive about the post-1789 form of liberalism is that we see a distinct sociological class whose prim primary concern is with self-actualization, self-fulfillment and wants to clear away uh, the constraints, economic, moral, traditional, on that project. Um, and in order to do so, um, you know, polemically, and in, in some sense appropriately given their project, tries to persuade the broader society that um, doing so um, is to the benefit of all. Um, and, and that's, that's um, my reference. Mm -hmm. Shard, can Europe overcome its culture of political falsifications? And if so, how? Hmm. Well, uh, I have always been bad in predicting the future. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, I, I do not see it happen in the... Uh, in the foreseeable future because uh, I do not see any sources, uh, uh, salient sources of renewal in European culture. Even if you take a uh, uh, great uh, uh, Britain, right, the, the, the United Kingdom, which uh, was the first country to leave the European Union being dissatisfied with the way things are being hand, uh, handled in the European Union and with the European bureaucracy rights stifling uh, uh, influence on people's lives. Even the United Kingdom is, uh, I think, uh, culturally in trouble. Uh, first, it's uh, almost completely s secular society. Uh, and. Uh, Secular society means the, this metaphysical dimension of, of human life is uh, absent. And also, despite the, the differences, we go to the political level, despite the, the differences between the, the, the political parties, uh, I do not see much of a difference between the, the left and the right, between the the Labour and the, and, and, and the Tories. So uh, I'm not talking about monarchy because monarchy uh, just uh, uh, follows the, uh, the the trend. So uh, so I, I do not see uh, any uh, uh, real sources of of new world. But what I see is. Uh, uh, more and more voices of uh, of criticism, right, of, the, of dissatisfaction. Some uh, are uh, more, I would say, metaphysically grounded. Uh, uh, some are, uh, uh, some are not. Some are. Uh, uh, it's it's just uh, you, you can see it in in, uh, in in some of the writers in. In France or in, in, in Germany, this uh, sentiment of dis disgust uh, that the people are fed up with. The, uh, uh, but but they at, at the same time they are devoid of any uh, metaphysical kind of power, right, to to oppose this. So uh, so I do not see uh, uh, 
the, uh, the, the, the actors, they could do it, but, but they see the growing awareness that things are going in the uh, wrong uh, uh, direction. And politically, of course, uh, that uh, may lead to some <coughs> change in the European uh, power structure within a, a couple of years, but that does not translate itself into uh, kind of spirit, spiritual uh, renewal. It's amazing when you, if you read the founding fathers of European in, in integration, the, the Gasper, the Schumann, all, the, all of them, other than that, all of them were saying that uh, the, the, the very number one in Europe is its. Uh, uh, spiritual character, uh, 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 first of all, Christianity. And, and they're all saying it quite emphatically that if you're talking about European unity on European integration, does not make sense if it's not grounded what is the real heritage of, uh, of Europe, that is Christianity, but also, also uh, classical met metaphysics and, and, and epistemology. Now this is gone, and this vacuum has been filled by all sorts of uh, 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 ideologies, which uh, uh, in fact are deepening the, 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 the crisis. Uh, so, uh, but that, that's a. Uh, uh, that, that's the future that I can see. If you ask me to look further, I, uh, I cannot tell you. So. Just quick for the whole group, the role of economic forces in these threats to national sovereignty. Any thoughts, any, any of you guys? We have note that that hasn't come up. Nobody mentioned that. Although, since we are in New York, I thought it would be fitting that we bring that forward. You don't have to, if, if nobody has anything to say, that's Well, fine. I mean, so the whole debate about Brexit, the, the British could just say goodbye and slam the door, but they are afraid to do that because they want to make sure that they will have favorable trade relations with Europe. And Europe is saying, hey, you can't just walk out. You got to pay your bills. We got all these claims on you. So at the least, if you're in the EU, it's scary to leave it because it's organized to retaliate on you. I would think one argument for the EU is that it's going to take it's going to take a lot of political power to to mess to, to to bring Google and Facebook and so forth to heal to serve the common good rather than simply to print money. And you're saying the EU can do it in a way that maybe Poland can't because it's it can be pushed around by these gigantic uh, global corporations. I don't feel I have a stake in defending Google, although I do have close relatives who happen to work for Google, but I will say, uh, I, it seems to me extremely unlikely that the EU, the way it is currently organized, would be the people you'll want to be bringing Google to a better version of Google. I mean, so, so just to start with, it's, it's a real bad reflection on Europe that they don't have their own Google. I mean, there's more people there, there's more wealth there. How come they don't have a Silicon Valley? And they just don't because they're just bad at being innovative. And then you say, okay, well, it's just true. So then you say, okay, you guys are bad at being innovative. American but triumphalism. Well, no, it's just America. true. They, they, they're not competing. And so, so then you say, okay, you guys can't really compete with us, but would you like to regulate us? Do you have something to compensate for your lack of innovative capacity? And the answer is, we have a lot of resentment. <laughs> I just feel, wow, that's not promising. I don't, uh, I don't agree with you. <laughs> well, that, uh, it's true there is a, a lot of anti-big corporations rhetoric in, in European Union. And, uh, well, the, the majority of the people there are uh, from the political left, so, you know, big business is always the, the enemy since the time of <coughs> Karl Marx. And, uh, uh, but uh, mm, uh, initially in, in, in Eastern Europe, so the big corporations were welcome as uh, civilizing forces. Uh, they bring uh, technology, uh, know-how, uh, 
money, right capital, and uh, <coughs> and so so we welcome them. Come on, guys, and invest, bring your people. And uh, well, uh, didn't quite work the way we, we hoped it would. Uh, quite recently, the uh, Minister of Finance uh, published a, a document uh, how much uh, uh, is paid in taxes uh, by the uh, big corporation, and, and most of them just didn't pay a single dollar uh, in taxes. Uh, there are way to evade taxes, as you know, and, uh, and what can we do? I mean, uh, it's extremely difficult to help them uh, pay the, the, the money that they should have uh, been paying. So, uh, so, so it's not, uh, uh, it, yes, there's, there's something to do with the so sovereignty, but, but the, I, I do not have any clear uh, remedy, right, or prescription how to do it, but, but certainly there is a, a connection, sometimes positive, sometimes negative, uh, between the sovereignty and the uh, uh, big uh, uh, international uh, corporations, international American. <laughs> Same thing. Uh, yeah, I'll I'll just add a word, which is I know a little about Google, but I, I will say that uh, from the standpoint of economic theory, none of this is necessarily an argument for the EU. And let me explain. So, um, to use an analogy, Ronald Coase's theory of the firm says that actors always face a choice between integrating into firms in order to cope with um, market competition or whether to proceed through spot transactions, spot contracts that are issue specific. And the political analog is one can cope with Google through an EU structure or one can cope with Google through um, issue specific multilateral treaties or even bilateral treaties. Um, and th that option is always in place even if the EU doesn't exist. Uh, final, because I feel like we have to bring this immigration. What is the relation between co uh, cultural unity and sovereignty? Jeremy, you've already hinted at that with this, I think, quite provocative and, and to, I never heard anybody say it, but it's very persuasive. You can't field a multicultural army. Or if you can, you can't count on them to stick it out when things get tough. Any other? Wait, did, isn't history full of multicultural ones? <laughs> <laughs> Thirty years ago, we were all in the core. Uh, I don't want to press the point, but I definitely <laughs> give, give, give your give your counter example. Uh, well, the. Uh, Imperial Roman armies were multicultural after roughly the first century. And that was really bad news when there started to be a lot of Germans and you couldn't rely on their loyalty. And they didn't want to fight very hard. They just wanted to overthrow the reigning emperor. They did pretty well for, uh, <laughs> they had a pretty good run there. No, this wasn't, I mean, all yeah. the, the, like, the Roman historians are already concerned about this at the start of that run. Well, but it's hard, it's hard to disentangle the economic problems of the poor from the, you know, specifically military problems of the multicultural army, but um, let, we're let, talking about, let's, at, at best, a very long run. Let's, let's also say that at the beginning, uh, when Rome had a lot more uh, cultural self-confidence, the Germans were being Romanized, and by later times, it was just harder to insist on that. Um, I think what you mean by an army is they have, um, that's the expression, esprit de corps. They have the spirit of the body, the body of the troops. And if you cannot summon that, you're really in trouble. And it's hard to do that if people think, well, I'm really in it for the money, and I'm going to be out of here after my next uh, payday. An army has to have more solidarity than a uh, corporation. So I mean, I, I, to, to go back to your question, that's a, that's a, I think, powerful example. I'm not saying like everything turns on that. But yes, of course you need to have a certain degree of cultural cohesion. Um, just to mention two other things. Um, 
if things go bad in your country, which happens, you know, there's a business cycle, there's events out in the world that, that put pressure on you, you have to appeal to people to say, okay, we're having a bad time, but you, you gotta hang in there, you gotta, you gotta stay with the country, and it's harder to, to sustain um, support for the country, for the Constitution, if people are very, very fractured and have a lot of animosity and suspicion. And it's true also if you have to ask people for, for <coughs> making sacrifices of other kinds, financial, if not just uh, personal. It's hard to do if you don't have some glue there, some sense that you care about the country. It is hard to care about the country if there doesn't seem to be some commonality which makes it seem necessary, given kind of long-term investment that we're all in it. And, and if you just say it's spot deals, to use Adrian's expression, well then people say, let's renegotiate. Would it be fair to say that friction points with the EU, and I take your point, the power players who are behind the EU, the friction points really do have to do often with Poland's efforts to renew cultural unity. Yeah, it's. I think. I think it's. 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 It's pretty fair. Yes. Uh, uh, well, just uh, let me uh, say that uh, uh, it's what, what we are against. What the Polish government and, and some other governments in, in Central Europe are against is this enforced mandatory relocation uh, plan that the uh, European institution uh, uh, established at the quota and the, the countries have to accept a certain number of, of immigrants. Uh, we, we are against it uh, for, for various reasons. First, uh, it, is, it is against the contradiction with the treaties that the European institutions have no prerogative to uh, uh, impose on us demographic policy. A demographic policy is a, is a, is, is a policy of, of, of sovereign government. Right? It's, it's a prerogative of the national government, not of the uh, uh, European institution. And, uh, and of course there is a, a, a bad <coughs> example of uh, some of the countries in, in, in Western Europe. I mean, the, the whole immigration process uh, uh, has, uh, uh, from the very beginning, was uh, uh, ill-conceived and it, it created uh, a, a lot of pro problems, uh, uh, obvious problems like uh, big, large communities that were uh, essentially and openly hostile to the country in which they were living and the assimilation didn't work because you had the, the, the terrorists that were sometimes the second generation, sometimes the, the third generation. So, so, so uh, well, uh, some groups melt and some do not. Uh, simply, uh, as, as simple as, as, as that. <laughs> And, uh, but we have, uh, we have uh, taken uh, a lot of Ukrainians, for example, and it, uh, there is no problem with uh, their being uh, in, 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 in Poland. So yes, it's a, it's a question of, of sovereignty in that particular case, because uh, uh, the European institution take over the prerogatives of the uh, national uh, a government, and then it, uh, uh, this policy may uh, also je jeopardize the risk of the security of the, of the, uh, of the country. Uh, so uh, yes, I would say that uh, it, it's, it's a major uh, uh, cause of uh, uh, con conflict, uh, tension between uh, you and, and, and my government. Questions? In the back. <coughs> Three points I need to pick up. One on Rusty's question. Speak up. One on Rusty's question about uh, Silicon Valley corporations and taming them. Why would Europe just continue in its deal that it has right now that Facebook and Google get sweetheart tax deals in Ireland 
And in exchange, Facebook and Google are very pliable about suppressing criticism of liberal elites. And just today, Google and Facebook have <laughs> policies to suppress pro-life campaigns in Ireland from advertising. Two, isn't the migrant quota a trick in the sense that the, these policies are desperately unpopular in Hungary and Poland? You would be settling a visible minority apartment block by apartment block if you acceded to it. Your party would be destroyed in the polls, and the migrants would leave anyway after six months to London or Berlin, where there are more generous benefits and communities to integrate into. And then three, this is sort of Adrian's point, is there any uh, is there anything to be said about the similarities of demonology of liberalism and its criticism? Liberalism criticizes its populist critics saying, you have this prejudiced attitude toward religious, unwashed, uncivilized fanatics from the outside. But liberalism's prejudice is against unwashed, uneducated, religious fanatics that are native. There's, a, there's, a, there's an odd symmetry to it, where the threat that potentially we see in migration is the very threat that they see in, well, us. Observations? Yes. David Gallagher? I was just going to ask. <coughs> yeah. Do um, you think Poland would be better off leaving the EU? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> first, first of all, uh, it's a uh, possible, uh, uh, possible because the, the overwhelming majority of Poles. Uh, want to be in the EU for, for many reasons. Uh, also because it, they believe it uh, gives them some kind of protection against the uh, threat from, from, from the East, being a, well, a part of a, a larger uh, community. But uh, there's a growing number of people who are dissatisfied with the direction the EU is going. So, so there is no there is no way that uh, we could be uh, we could leave the, the, the EU in the in the foreseeable future. Yeah, there is a follow up. I just wonder if these factors that when you start looking at them, economic security, even police functions, all kinds of things, don't point to um, just conditions of the contemporary world, the technology, especially that we have. That makes the kind of sovereignty that was possible 100 years ago, 200 years ago, maybe really not possible now. In other words, the interconnections of nations are so great and so close that you need, you do need supranational entities. They may not be the EU, but you know, you need Interpol. You need to coordinate airlines. You need. There's all kinds of things that need to be coordinated now that they, they didn't need that in the past. And each one, you might say, a little tiny bit of sovereignty is being given up. Some of them you do, and some of them you don't. I mean, you may you, you may need a Interpol, but I don't think you need a European uh, foreign minister or, 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 or minister of finance or, or monetary union. I think that uh, uh, the, uh, the the, the uh, original. Sin was uh, was the Maastricht Treaty on the formation of the European Union, the uh, 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 economic European Economic co uh, Community was a uh, perfectly workable arrangement when they started, uh, you know, building these uh, institutions like uh, and the com common currency and com common army. Well, it's, it's not uh, done yet, but it's that common foreign policy and all this. I mean, this, this is just non nonsense. Uh, Harmonization of, 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 of taxes and, and so on. Can you ask a question of Professor Luduko here? I'm curious whether you think there's any reality to the loose talk one hears about possible supranational <coughs> alternatives to the EU. So things like the Visegrad group, things like possible coalition of Central European nations that might um, integrate in some distinctive way. Is, is all that just fantasy or is that? It's, it's not fantasy, but it's not really an, an, an alternative. These are loose alliances. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it's still this, this, this power structure that is uh, 
they are big guys and uh, 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 they are not so big guys. So uh, yes, there is the Visegrad group, right? We, we for, for group we work uh, together. We analyze in, in terms of uh, opposing uh, uh, mm, uh, uh, mandatory relocation of, of, of immigrants or in other uh, areas. But, but at the same time, uh, the, the countries like uh, the, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, are s s small countries, and uh, they are very much dependent on the powerful neighbor, which is. Uh, uh, Germany, so uh, so it, it won't be really an, any uh, serious confrontation, but uh, but it, it it does make a difference. Those small loose uh, alliances, and uh, Chancellor Merkel was very irritated by the, the fact that. Uh, <laughs> uh, such alliances are uh, three seasons. Three seasons. I, I, I just, Jeremy, on this point, yeah, I, I just wanted to pick up um, the last thing that you mentioned was harmonizing taxes. And the first question that we had about Google was like, oh, the EU lets them get cheap, uh, low taxes in Ireland. It's not a matter of what. They, 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 the, the member states have not agreed that tax harmonization is a proper role of the EU. And that would be a huge. Uh, move towards a, a super state in Europe. We don't have that in the United States. Each state sets its own taxes and lives with it. And in fact, we're moving away from, we have been subsidizing it through federal income tax to get to deduct your state taxes, right? And that has now just now been changed, which is moving back in the direction of you live with the state government that you elect and the taxes they want to impose. It'd be a big, big change. For, for Europe to go there, and I don't think they're ready to, and I think that's just one of a number of examples of, it's helpful, I think, to all the member states, whether they realize it or not, to have ornery countries like Poland digging in their heels. On, on the tax thing, Ireland is an ordinary country. I mean, this is a hard project if you actually let individuals, if you actually say that it requires the agreement of all the member states, which is why they often cheat and say, oh, well, you kind of uh, 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 try and work around it. But you, you could make a di I think you're being a little pessimistic there if I could um, say that. Uh, I think it makes a big difference to have states digging in and resisting on important policies. Uh, Max, yes. So uh, Professor Rapp can uh, mention that with the return of sovereignty, there is a return of history. Yeah. So both the sense of an inheritance yeah. from your ancestors and passing on to your children. Yeah. But isn't there another element to this, which is, the return of the notion of the sacred. So if one's to challenge a liberal you know, procedural consensus, one has to appeal to some other source. You know, what is the source of sovereignty? Isn't that, so sacred horizon emerges, you know, maybe it's an allusion to the holy crown of St. Stephen in Hungary or to uh, the kingship of Christ in Poland or uh, crosses in Bavaria. So I just want to ask the panelists about the return of uh, is there a return of the sacred connected with this? Could be. Yes, there is. I mean, that's, to me, no one understand. Speak up, speak up. No, I mean, I understand what you're saying. And I, from my perception, I think that's a crucial point of the whole struggle that we're going for now, is that kingship of Jesus Christ in relationship to <laughs> the other forces out um, so Poland, to me, is, I just wanted to say I'm very grateful that Poland is standing strong in that regard. And one of the last strongholds of the European countries right now, and they are a beacon of light to all of us and to America. That's how I perceive my relationship to Poland and what they're trying to stand for. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes. Queen Mandy, Space of America is the beacon of life. How how light? How can we do for, for what can we do for Poland? What can we do for Poland? Like stay in stay in the EU. So how, what can we do? For you? <laughs> well, uh, we uh, sometimes our benevolence 
uh, can yeah. be counterproductive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, the, the Polish government uh, uh, considers the United States the most important uh, uh, ally in, in, in terms of uh, security. But, uh, and, uh, and this building up the, uh, the east, eastern flank of, of NATO. And, uh, and when your president visited, visited Poland recently, it was a huge uh, uh, success. And you really count on uh, closer uh, military security alliance right, between Poland and the United States. Uh, <laughs> we pay lip, lip, uh, lip service to the European system of security, but we don't really trust uh, uh, the European security, which also irritates our European partners. <laughs> and uh, so that's uh, that's the obvious thing that, that comes to my mind, and it's it's really important, right? and uh, it is is being used uh, in this. Uh, uh, Political debates, but uh, but I'm, I'm I'm sure all kinds of uh, uh, closer uh, contacts. True, uh, uh, especially between the, the, the conservative sides in the United States and uh, in Poland. Yes, Poland. I uh, thank you for for what you said about Poland. Much appreciated. Uh, yes, I believe we are one of the few, if not the last, uh, country in Europe, aren't we? That in, in which the, the, the sacred is important. There are, of course, formidable uh, enemies within, uh, but uh, uh, it's, it's not as easy. Uh, and, and they have strong allies uh, everywhere. I had a word in about Matthew's question, which which I didn't want to drop. I thought it was an excellent one. Um, I don't think the sacred ever went away. Uh, let me explain. So. Um, let me distinguish two two aspects of the sacred. One is the transcendent numinous, and the other is the absolute. And what's distinctive about liberalism as a world religion is that it has um, the latter but not the former, that it is, has a, a secularized, um, immanentized absolute into politics. And in, in that sense of the sacred, it's uh, been present in the liberal project and to the extent the EU is liberal, present in the EU project, so the liturgies of liberalism, the liturgies of liberalism, <laughs> and and the revealing the revealing moments always come when um, European actors depart from political or economic rash, rationality in the service of some um, some impulse that they sort of can't help um, promoting. And I simply footnote uh, Merkel's immigration policy as a possible example. Oh, one final question, uh, Nathan. Thank you. I, I want to. I think panelists talked a great deal about their theoretical views, but I want to push them to a bit of practical political philosophy, if you will. And it, it has to do with the the problem of the European map, which I think is is advanced uh, to a, a significant degree. You do find people who, when asked to choose if they wanted to vote Leave or Remain, for example, they said. Well, I may recognize there are problems with the European Union, it's undemocratic, but I don't want to give up my freedom of mobility. Um, so, do you see, is there room to persuade this European man or European youth, or uh, is it really just a political struggle, a, a, a friend enemy distinction? Or maybe just going off the last one, last point that just you know, that comes to mind. Can you convert a European liberal? <laughs> no. It's 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 a friend enemy from from their from their point of view at least a, a person like uh, the uh, honourable panelists is, for them they, they shouldn't exist at all and, uh, an insult to human intelligence so, uh, so no uh, no absolutely absolutely I don't know uh, how. The change may occur if, if, if it occurs. What, what sort of uh, uh, <coughs> developments must occur? How? What, you had, you know, you, you had all, all kinds of tragic events 
also here, right, in, 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 in the States, we, and in, in Europe. Uh, it's, it's before our eyes that the, the, the things are going in, in the wrong direction. But now the, the, the problem with, with terrorism, right? You, you could uh, 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 hear 911, right? You, there are all, all sorts of things. And uh, we, if you talk them, they, they repeat this multicultural mantra. Now that is absolutely irrelevant. We have to, well, full speed ahead. So, no. I, I, I would like to say something about that. I mean, I'm sure there are individuals who are true believers and nothing will shake them as, you know, there were old communists who died in their 90s in the last decade and they said, I think Stalin should have built more dams in places that would have generated more power and then we could have lasted another few decades and they, they were in an alternate reality. But, but. Um, you know, generations change from what their parents and grandparents thought. There's been a lot of change in Europe. This figure that you're invoking, European man, um, 30 years ago people wouldn't have known what that was. And I see no reason at all to think like, that's it. That's the final version of humanity in Europe. No reason at all to think that. And I've just mentioned that Part of the baggage, or, or if you like, the rocket fuel of this project is, it's the future, it's the future. We know it's the future. Some excellent passages in Professor Lugutko's book about this, this sense of inevitability, this way in which it's the successor to Marxism-Leninism. We know the future, and it's united Europe. Well, it happened finally to the Marxist-Leninists. They looked around, and they saw, like, hey, no one else is joining. You know, it peaked in 1961. And then decade after decade after decade, no one else wanted to join. And the people who were outside were happier and happier to, to be outside. And you can see this also with the European project. I mean, in the 90s, they were saying, this is obviously the future, and the whole world is moving towards supranational, because inevitably, because you have to, because blah, 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 blah. There's not one other place in the world that has anything remotely like the European construction. You know, they don't have it in South Asia, they don't have it in Latin America. They don't speak Spanish in Latin America unless they speak Portuguese. They're all Catholic or former Catholic or whatever they are. If it could work anywhere, you'd think it'd be in Latin America. No, thank you. No, they don't want to do it. <coughs> they, they, they pretend to do it in Africa, but they're just kidding. I mean, it is like not anywhere in the world where this has been thought of. So that's very telling. And then it turns out that people are not more and more happy about it in Europe. They're not getting more and more accustomed to it. They're getting more and more irritable about it. Right, but actually having Britain leave, that is a huge blow. Right, and they kept saying, it's a mistake, right? You don't really mean it, right? I mean, you're not actually doing it, right? But no, they are actually doing it. So I, I don't think it has a bright future. If it doesn't have a bright future, it loses an awful lot of its luster. Because an awful lot of its luster was propagandistic. It was you have to because it's inevitable and everyone else is joining and come on, you got it. And then if it turns out that actually, you know, it's flagging and people are leaving, then you actually have to think about it. And if you have to think about it, I want to say this for young people, it's easier for young people to think about things. Any thoughts on converting liberals? <laughs> well, uh, two. One is uh, I highly recommend uh, Tim or Curran's work on preference falsification. So these are models in which, in a population, everybody can be insisting on a certain view. Um, but some fraction of them secretly harbor doubts. Uh, and when there's a triggering event that brings the doubts into the open, then you can see very rapid switches in which the uh, view of the whole population changes rather suddenly. Um, so that's one thing to think about. And the other thing I'll simply say is that when Paul articulated his very strange views at the Areopagus. Uh, many scoffed and departed, but a few were intrigued and stayed behind to listen. Uh, so. A beautiful way to end. Um, thank you very much to our panelists. Please Coming and, uh, well, thank you. What, what is, uh, do we sing the Polish national anthem now? Or? If you want. <laughs> good. Good about that. Thank you very, very much good. again, Rusty, for organizing this. Thanks to join up with us.